The objective today is to describe the importance of the 8086 processor. And I've been doing a series of uh, reading the Intel manual, and it inspired me to create this lesson just so everybody really understands the importance of the 8086 processor. This chip is what brought us our modern architecture that you can find on many desktop computers, um, whether the chip is made by Intel or AMD. And so I figured I'd go over the details of that so you can uh, just better wrap your mind around this. It's a little bit of a history video, but mostly a technical video. All right, so your first technical uh, fact is that this is a 16-bit microprocessor. Uh, Intel moved from the 8-bit to the 16-bit, and that was pretty impressive. Now, this chip was designed in 1976, and in June 8th, 1978, it was released. And I went ahead and added the uh, small details of, like, the exact day it was released, because in this Intel 8088 um, is released just, like, almost exactly one year later in 1979. And it's this 8088 that was really impressive. 8086 was kind of, like, just, like, laying down the design we know as x86 architecture. And Intel and AMD will go ahead and continue using this architecture for years and years to come. And as you can see right here, it says it is a slightly modified chip with an external 8-bit data bus. So I'll show you a picture in a little bit so you can better wrap your mind around like what a data bus is. Essentially, this 8-bit data bus allows the use of cheaper and fewer supporting uh, integrated circuits. So back in these early days of computers, you can imagine uh, if they can do things cheaper, that's going to bring more computers to your, like, common man. And at this time, this processor is notable as the processor used in the original IBM PC design. And I want to make note here that I cannot confirm that because I did do some additional research here. All the old IBMs I found seem to have been running the 8088, which, to be technical about it, um, the 8088 is considered a variant of the 8086 because of their uh, slight modifications. So that had me asking, how can the 8086 be considered notable as the processor for an IBM computer, when based on all my research, it seems like the IBM computers are actually using the 8088. Later on, I found that Compact was the one who seems to have been like really using the 8086 in a lot of their computers in the 80s. So maybe to help get our bearings straight, there's these terms called uh, coprocessor and variant, and I saw this all over uh, my research in studying older microchips. And so the way this works is you could have something like the Intel 8087, and this thing is considered a coprocessor to the 8086. What's a coprocessor? This is a computer processor used to supplement the functions of the primary processor, in this case the 8086. And what it does is the types of operations like floating point arithmetic or graphics or signal processing and or string processing, even cryptography, maybe some input output interfacing stuff. And by having this coprocessor, common person at the time could uh, save money because inclusion of this processor is just very optional. And I plan on doing a totally separate video all about the motherboard. And so when you're looking at a motherboard, especially in a class like mine where I ask my students to identify the processor, the CPU that is. There's a lot of little chips on any motherboard. So a little bit of an aha moment that uh, a computer is made up of several processing chips. It's just the biggest one is called uh, the CPU. I mean, thus the C as in central. Now if you hear the term variant, it says that there are many variants of processors built to use less power at the cost of some of the processor's other features. So you could choose a variant depending on your needs. And to really wrap your mind around the difference between the 8088 and the 8086, you can um, watch my video specifically about the 8088. And in fact, I made a video on the 8080, which came before 8086, obviously. And even that was drastically different than the 8086. Okay, so let's look at a chip that came directly before the 8086, not surprisingly, the 8085. This is the predecessor. And Intel was making this from 1976 all the way up into 2000, which just blows my mind that they were still making these chips. But I'm sure they wouldn't have done it if there wasn't money in doing so. This 8085 had a clock speed of 3, 5, and 6 megahertz. So, wow, really slow in 2019 standards. Now the size was 3 micrometers, so to wrap your mind around micrometers, here you go, I have a little 
quick picture, I mean, uh, this entire big circle is the size of a human hair, so that's 100 micrometers. So when they say 3 micrometers, I'm wondering if this is a reference to like the actual size of the transistor inside of the chip. But if we're talking uh, cell phones nowadays, we're going to talk about uh, their processors being in the nanometers, so even smaller. Speaking of transistors, though, this thing had 6,500 of them. In terms of an instruction set, this one is just called 8085 and it is an 8-bit chip, while this 8086 has an instruction set called x86, and as I said before, that doubles in size in terms of there's 16 bits in that instruction set. And I suppose the term just comes from the fact that an instruction size, like if you looked at the assembly code, um, the size of the instruction is 8 bits long. Now the tricky thing with this 8085 is that the data width was 8 bits, but the address width was 16 bits, so it's kind of hard for me to wrap my mind around that. I always talk about bottlenecks in class. I'm sure Intel had to make a lot of choices to try to <laughs> limit the amount of bottlenecks that they had to deal with. And if you saw my video where I briefly flipped through the 8085 manual, I just want to note here that the difference between the 8085 chip and the chip called 8085A was this was Intel's way, the 8085, of fixing some bugs in the original. And apparently it didn't take them very long because they quickly fixed these bugs and just replaced that chip. And if you're interested, I mean, here are all the pins that make up the 8085 and uh, a brief description of what each pin does. And as you can see, there's uh, 40 total pins. It's just amazing to think that an older chip like this, uh, made in 1976, uh, this was 40 pins. Nowadays, we have like 900 pins on a chip. And some chips aren't even uh, male chips. Like these two, uh, you can have a female chip. That just means your socket would be a male socket. So Intel, you know, played around with different designs, probably looking for the best one. Now to give you a comparison of all the technical details of the 8086 compared to what we just looked at in the 8085, uh, this is produced from 1978 to 1998. So isn't that weird to see that they stopped in 1998 while this one, they kept going, at least according to Wikipedia. So the name of this 8086 instruction set is technically um, x86-16, referencing 16 bits. And look at that, 29,000 transistors, while this one had 6,500 transistors. Over here with our pin diagram, we can see that it too has 40 pins. Later, I'll talk about pin 33 here, the min and max mode pin. But before I do that, let's jump to the successor. So right after the 8086 came the 8186, and then the 8286. And I did a little research, like, why are they calling uh, these chips these numbers? Well, it's just like an inventory name. I guess there's, like, no significance. At first, I thought, is there, like, 86 pins on the chip? But as you saw, no, only 40 pins. So I just think of like an accountant's book with a list of all the product names and then you assign numbers to those products. That's just what these chip manufacturers walked around referring to the uh, chips as. And so I'm looking at this and like, ooh, it's sleek. It looks so much nicer than this one. So now we're moving into these uh, squares instead of long rectangles. They kept making the 8186 all the way up until 2007. This is pretty cool. You went from 6 megahertz all the way up to 25 megahertz, so that's like more than double what the 8086 was doing. But as you can see, we're still at a 16-bit instruction set. So without further ado, I'm sure you've been sitting here wanting to see an actual computer that the 8086 was used in. Well, first, let's start with the computer that housed the 8085. So for example, the IBM 5322 was a type of computer that held the 8085. I did some extra rapid research just because I knew computers had these cassette tapes in them. And we're talking 1975 now. Uh, the Model 5100 is IBM's first mini computer. So it's not a mainframe. That's the uh, difference between a mini computer and a mainframe. Nowadays, I think we just call them desktops. Maybe back then they just wanted to emphasize the fact that a mini computer is smaller than this gigantic box, almost size of a room computer. 
but this thing right here is considered the world's first portable computers. And this one was using an IBM CPU. Now, when the 5110 came along, three years later, 1978, that thing also used IBM's uh, CPU. But by the time we get into the 1980s, that next version, that's when we're going to start seeing 8088 chips placed in the IBM computers. And if you go to this website, you could do a lot of research on the old computers. Now I have a series of slides here called Notable Points of Interest in terms of uh, hardware modes on the 8086. There were some control pins which carry essential signals for all your external operations, so external outside of the chip that is. These control pins have more than one function depending upon whether the device is being operated in a minimum or maximum mode. The minimum mode is just intended for a small single processor system while the maximum mode is for medium or large systems using more than one processor. So remember when we talked about the coprocessor, if you got an 8086 and you're working with an 8087, then this maximum mode would have needed to be a triggered. And as a reminder, there it is. So if this pin is a one, you are in maximum mode. And now when you change the voltage on that pin, some of the other pins will have a different function most of which is related to how the CPU handles the local bus. And someday I hope to uh, dive deeper into a diagram like this, but essentially inside of a chip you have uh, certain buses, like this one is called the internal data bus. Up here you have the address bus, and so the bus, as you can kind of hear in the name, it's all about transporting the ones and zeros into the places that they need to go. So when you're doing something like uh, moving a value from one place to the other, that value would need to exist for a short uh, time on a bus. I always recommend Ben Eater videos for you to kind of better uh, visualize what that means. He builds an 8-bit eight uh, computer from the ground up, and he's using all these wires, and so it's kind of easier to visualize when you see something like that. And when we're talking about a low level, you can have like code like this, assembly language code, that has what's called an opcode, that is like an action that can be taken on two different operands. And I liked studying the older computers because it was an aha moment for me when I was just getting into this to understand that like why is so much electricity being moved around a computer? Well it makes a lot more sense if you think of it in terms of like we have this hard disk, maybe there's a video game saved on that disk? Well as I'm looking at my monitor, the game's not there. If I start a series of actions to bring the game there so I could see it, then I'm just moving a lot of data around. I'm going to the hard drive, bringing that data to the RAM, processing it through a processor. And that's why we're constantly talking about movement in code. And yes, a little math, because math on binary numbers is just uh, changing and moving code. Let me focus here because the 8086 processor had some new instructions, right? New code or new uh, commands. And these instructions were not present in the earlier chips. And what did these instructions do? They better supported stack-based high-level programming languages such as Pascal. And some of the more useful instructions are like push memory operations and return sizes, uh, supporting the Pascal calling uh, convention directly. Okay, to summarize, when I have new instructions, I can do more with the ones and zeros, and that is desirable. As chips get better, we are doing more with the ones and zeros, and that means we should have some like signals when some sort of action is being taken on those ones and zeros, and these we call flags. So after creating some sort of new value, the 8086 had a 16-bit flag register. Nine of these condition code flags are active and indicate the current state of the processor. And for some reason, Intel has always done this. They have some X's here, so they're not going to use every bit within that register. So let's say you took some action on some ones and zeros. You could have a carry flag here that would be turned on if that action had needed you to carry a one from one bit to the other. Just like in math, sometimes you have to carry to complete the math problem. Then we have uh, parity flags, so that's even and odd stuff. You'll have a little confusing one called auxiliary carry flag. I went over that one in my uh, e-flags video about the Intel manual. There's a zero flag, so that'll be on if the result of whatever your action is all zeros. You have a sign flag for negative numbers. 
And then you have a couple other flags. Now, this register is sometimes referred to as a status word, but here's a nice diagram. So you can see uh, how that register was laid out. Now, small programs could ignore the segmentation that the 8086 enabled and just use plain 16-bit addressing. And this allowed some of the older software, the 8-bit software, to be quite easily ported to the 8086. So Intel was obsessed with making old stuff work on modern things, maybe to encourage people to buy the modern things and not worry about their older games or programs not working on their new device. Though in the 70s and 80s here, having computers were much rarer than they are today. Now one nice thing about the portability of these processors, it says that the authors of MS-DOS took advantage of that by providing an application programming interface, also known as an API, which was very similar to the CPE slash M operating system. And what this means is if you saw a .com extension, file extension, that was an executable, that was a program that you could run, and therefore that file format was identical to that CPM machine. And not surprisingly, this was important when the 8086 and MS-DOS were new because it allowed many existing CPM and other applications to be quickly made available. So Intel was giving people no reason not to get their computer or their new processor. And so as you can imagine, I mean, they're a business, they're making good business choices, but think about the um, opposite type of uh, society or environment where money was not a motivation. It says that uh, the electronics industry of the Soviet Union was able to replicate the 8086 through both industrial espionage, that is spies working inside of Intel, and just pure reverse engineering. So the Soviets basically stole the designs for the 8086 and created this chip, the K1810VM86. <laughs> There's that 86 in it. And this Soviet chip was binary and pin compatible with the 8086. They're a bit later in terms of um, when they were developing or at least uh, mass producing those. So to wrap up the lesson, here's just like your typical computer that was used in the 8086 processor. And so now I hope you're a little more comfortable when you hear this term x86. It is a reference to the first chip that was made using this particular design. And so here's your chance to tell me everything you retained from that lesson. And don't be that person that just looks directly at the picture and say the 8086 processor was made in both ceramic and plastic. You know, go deeper with the technical details we just learned from the lesson.